Dr. Afua Cooper is Professor of Black and African Diaspora Studies at Dalhousie University. She led the scholarly panel on Dalhousie's history on slavery and race, which delivered its report several months ago. An accomplished poet, Dr. Cooper was recently awarded the Portia White Prize for Artistic and Cultural Excellence. And on the 13th of May, just a couple of weeks ago, she was one of the winners among the Atlantic Book Awards, where she won the Poetry Award for Black Matters. That was the J.M. Abraham Poetry Award. On the 9th of April last month, Dalhousie University announced that Dr. Cooper will be leading a three year, $1 million plus federally funded project entitled A Black People's History of Canada. And this will fill a much needed gap in African Canadian history education as a detailed and varied online resource. So we will be looking forward, Dr. Cooper, to much more about that in the months to come. This evening, Afua is going to present on The Black Refugees and Lord Dalhousie, a story in seven letters. She will examine the correspondence between Lieutenant Governor Dalhousie and the Earl of Bathurst, the administrator of Britain's colonies at the time. Setting the historical context of slavery, war and settlement, Dr. Cooper shows how the letters reveal Dalhousie's biases. His prejudices contribute to the cruel and unjust treatment of one of Nova Scotia's founding black communities. People who had escaped enslavement on American plantations for freedom with the British during the War of 1812. Ahua Cooper, it is an honor and the floor is now yours. Thank you, Lois, for such a wonderful introduction. And thanks to the Society for the, um, the invitation. It's my pleasure. And I greet all the members of the Zoom audience. I, as uh, Lois um, uh, stated just now, I will be looking at the correspondence between Lord Dalhousie and the, the Earl Bathurst who Bathurst was the Secretary of State for the, the colonies. So in, in many ways, he ran the look, headed the administration that looked at the over, Brit, Brit, Britain's overseas colonies, including Nova Scotia and the rest of the Canadian um, provinces. So what I'm gonna do right now is to share, share my screen. And I just wanna ask, Sarah, any one of the Sarahs, if they can see it. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, looks perfect. Okay, very good. And what I'll be doing is, is to read, read from my paper. So the first image we have there is the older building, is the original building of the first Dalhousie University, which um, was on the Grand Parade along Barrington Street there. Um, some of you, I, I think that the new Our City Hall sort of morphed out of this building. In the middle is an image of Lord Dalhousie himself, who came to the province of Nova Scotia um, in October 1816, and he stayed for four years, and then he left to take up the post as Governor General of um, British North America, the, 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 his seat was in Quebec City. And the next picture is um, the current Henry Hicks building, the center of Dalhousie's academic administration on present day Dalhousie University campus. And for context, it was Lord Dalhousie himself, um, George Ramsey, who founded Dalhousie University. So the, uh, as I said, for this presentation, I will focus on Dalhousie's treatment of the black refugees of the war of 1812 
by examining seven letters he wrote to his superior, Henry Bathurst, the third Earl Bathurst, and Secretary of War and for the colonies on the question of the refugees. Dalhousie arrived in Nova Scotia in October 1816, as stated, to take up his post as Lieutenant Governor of the colony. He was preceded by Sir John Cope Sherbrooke, who had left Nova Scotia to take up the role of Governor General of British um, North America. So as you can see, these governorships are really um, uh, provided opportunities for many of these men, uh, many of whom were uh, veterans of various wars to, to gain an income from the imperial government. Dalhousie himself left four years after he came and Sir James Kempt would assume the governorship of Nova Scotia after Dalhousie. The black refugees would arrive, settle and struggle under the administrations of these three governors, but it was under Dalhousie that their settlement would be consolidated. So just who were the black refugees of the War of 1812? So these were a former African-American enslaved people who had deserted their American masters and fled to the British standard during the War of 1812. The black refugees came mainly from Virginia, Maryland, and coastal Georgia. Additionally, several hundreds also came from Louisiana and Florida. And as we examine this work more closely, um, we realize that many, many more came from Louisiana. In fact, one document that I'm looking at presently um, is a, a note from Dalhousie, which stated that around 1817, over a hundred black refugees arrived in Nova Scotia and he called them, he called them half Indian and half French. He said they were speaking French and that they were half Indian, Choctaw, uh, Cherokee, and so forth. Additionally, um, so when the war broke out between the United Kingdom and the United States, hostility naturally extended to British North America. The British, using Halifax and Bermuda as naval headquarters, blockaded American ports, and British ships sailed into inlets and bays along the Chesapeake, harassing American settlements and plantations. By 1813, enslaved Americans began fleeing their plantations and running to British ships. To encourage this effort in 18, April 1814, the British Admiral Alexander Cochrane, commander of the British Navy for North America and the West Indies, issued a memorandum inviting enslaved Africans to join the British standard. So the enslaved people themselves started uh, running to the, the British side before Cochrane issued his, stand, uh, his memo. His memo was in recognition of, of this fact. In Cochrane's declaration, the runaways were promised um, freedom at the end of the war and um, that they would be transported to and resettled in a British territory. By the time the war ended in December 1814, close to 5,000 enslaved children, women and men would have left their owners and had joined the British. So I, I will not read Cochrane's proclamation. Basically, he just said, if you come, um, we will settle you at the end of the war in British possessions, whether in North America or in the West Indies, and you will be given support um, once you get to um, a, a British territory. Um, so, as I've mentioned, thousands of people came, according to Alan Taylor, by the time the war ended, at least 5,000 people had, had fled, and more could have uh, fled to the British standard, but the 5,000 is a, a figure that's agreed upon by many scholars. Uh, I'm not saying 5,000 came to Nova Scotia. I'm saying we know at least that number um, fled. And at the end of the war, 
when um, at least 3,000 were settled in Nova Scotia and about 500 of that number were sent to New Brunswick, um, Black refugees were settled in other places like Trinidad, for example, the Bahamas and Bermuda. So those who fled to British ships and posts worked as soldiers, marines, spies, sappers, guides, sailors, cooks, laundresses, and in a host of other employment. A unit of former enslaved Americans called the British Corps of Colonial Marines uh, was part of the British force that marched to Washington DC, laid waste the city and burnt the White House. Black soldiers and Marines engaged the Americans in numerous military encounters on land and sea. At the end of the war, members of this Marine Corps and their families were settled in Trinidad, as I mentioned. And in Trinidad, they organized their villages as military companies, an arrangement that, uh, that has persisted to this day. In 2013, on the, um, the 200th anniversary of, of the war, I visited Trinidad and visited some of these company villages. So you have first company, second company, the villages called second company, third company, fourth company, primary school. And so the, the descendants of, of these Marines, they still retain uh, that memory. Another 3,000 of these uh, families were landed in Halifax between 1813 and 1817, and a number of them were, were sent on to New Brunswick. The idea that Britain gave the refugees their freedom must be rethought. It was these former Americans who fought for and gained their freedom. It was they who took the initiative <clears throat> and fled their owner's farms and plantations. And remember, if they were caught, they would be severely punished or even killed. It was they who found the location of British ships through their own intelligence and offered their services for the prosecution of war and they performed ga gallantly. At the time of the arrival of the refugees in 1813 to Nova Scotia, Lord Sherbrooke was governor of the province, or Sir Sherbrooke, he wasn't a lord. Bathurst had instructed Cochrane, remember Cochrane is a military, um, uh, not the military, it, the, the naval admiral, Admiral Cochrane, and Bathurst had instructed Cochrane to send the refugees to um, Bermuda and to Nova Scotia. In fact, Nova Scotia had not been given a choice in the matter. The order came from the British Parliament. And so over the course of the next two years, several hundred refugees were placed on Melville Island, a military station in the northwest arm of Halifax. There, hundreds of refugees lived and died. Some of them died. From Melville Island, under Sherbrooke's and Dalhousie's regimes, Refugees were placed on land in such places as the Prestons, Beachville, Hammonds Plains, Windsor, Beaver Bank, St. Croix, Newport, Dartmouth, Halifax, and other places close to Halifax. The land they were given were rocky and swampy and generally of, of a poor quality. Most were given only 10 acres of land and insufficient amount of land to make one into a successful yeoman farmer. Contrast this with the amount of land given to the white heads of households who settled in the province around the same time as the black refugees. Whites were given 100 acres of land, the minimum amount of land required to ensure successful farming. Furthermore, the refugees were given licenses of operation, of occupation rather, for the land. This meant that they could only live on the land, but could not sell it or even relocate to greener pastures. In effect, they were squatters. If the refugees had dreamt of becoming landowners, this was not going to happen fast with those holding license of occupation or in other co contexts, tickets of, of location. The truth of the matter was that the refugees were conceived of uh, 
by the Nova Scotian government as a pool of labor to which white Nova Scotians could dip into whenever they had need for such labor. That is why the Blacks were given the poorest quality of land and only a few acres. The government did not intend for them to become an independent community. Their station in life was to continue in the same role they had played during slavery, that is, as hewers of wood and drawers of water. In war, the British deployed the refugees and their skills, talents, and labor to fight for them. Now that the war was over, the British thought of the refugees in the same light, or I should say, um, servants of the crown, officials of the crown. The function of the refugees was to fulfill the labor needs of whites, local, colonial, or imperial. Many refugee men were able to find work as laborers in road and highway construction. Some found maritime employment. Some women were able to secure work as domestics. Families cultivated fruits and vegetable gardens. Eventually, many refugee families, especially the women, began selling foodstuff, brooms, baskets, and other woven products in the Halifax market. But the community suffered. Most, if not all, in the early years of settlement were destitute. The refugee fe refugees felt that they could count on the government for support to tide them over these early years of settlement as part of the promise they had secured from the Crown during the war. They were to be disappointed. Neither under Sherbrooke nor Dalhousie's regime did the refugee find ready support. And so let us now turn to um, these letters. Let us examine the, the relationship that Dalhousie had with, with the refugees. So when the Earl Dalhousie arrived first in the province, he evinced sympathy for the refugees upon touring some of their communities. Dalhousie wrote his first letter to Bathurst soon after his arrival in the province. In a letter dated November 2nd, 1816, he reports to Bathurst that the colony was in disarray. Its accounts, and I quote, two quarters in arrears and the Negro families that had settled in a state of starvation, their crops having totally failed. He blames their settlement on the temporary administrator of the colony. So there was an administrator between the departure of Sherbrooke and the arrival of, of, um, of Dalhousie, Stracy Smith. Um, so he administered the colony for, for six months. So Dalhousie blames him for the terrible condition in which um, he, Dalhousie, thought the colony was in when he arrived. So he, he asserts that the previous administrator did not choose to take any charge of these matters. Six months had passed since Sherbrooke's departure. It seemed that very little had been done in regard to the condition of the Black refugees in that year of general crop failure. So remember Dalhousie is saying the refugees are in a state of starvation, their crops having totally failed that year all across the, the province and the region, um, people experience crop failure. And, and we'll, we'll get more to that. A volcano had, um, you know, erupted in Indonesia and it really um, co compromised the, well, compromise is, is putting it mildly for m many, many days, months, the, the sun was, was blocked out as a result of the explosion. But let's continue, we will get to that. In the letter, Dalhousie refers to Sherbrooke's letter of June 5th, 1816. So Sherbrooke wrote this letter to Bathurst, where the latter had made inquiries to Bathurst on several points in relation to the colony. Presumably, these inquiries would have been on the number of black refugees arriving in the colony and their condition the number that had already arrived and had been settled, the cost of providing for their needs, and when he could expect funds to arrive from Britain. 
Dalhousie further notes that he had been unable to find answers to Sherbrooke questions, and he finds himself, and I quote, placed in a very embarrassing position without guide or instructions, unquote. Nevertheless, in this letter, he reports that unsure John Sherbrooke's leaving this place, meaning the depot at Melville Island, um, the depot had been broken up, the Negro families dispersed in the new settlement or at work, rations had been ordered for those who had settled on land, granted them, and the amounts to be continued as before by the collector of um, customs in whose absence he had appointed, um, in whose absence his appointed duly acted. So uh, quickly, the collector of customs had been the one sort of finding the money and, and the, the goods and the food for the refugees. And so Dalhousie notes that in his letter to Sherbrooke. But he writes angrily about the fact that the interim administrator left in charge during the summer and early fall had failed to continue rations after August. And he says, the whole, the whole affairs have stood still for three months and the Negroes left in a deplorable state. Dalhousie also shows some compassion when he refers to the dreadful severity of the winter here to people brought from hot climes and asserts that it is necessary to continue the rations until 1st June next, 1st June 1870. I mean, it's not that the people really brought from hot climes, as he's putting it. If you're coming from Alabama and Louisiana, yes, but not so much from Virginia and Chesapeake. Nonetheless, the point is well taken. And he, he said he's going to um, continue rations until 1st of June and to provide to the most needy what supplies of clothing sent out for them remain in store. And that's the end of that. He informs Bathurst that he is carrying out what Sherbrooke had ordered but had not provided for. That is, merchants had not been paid for the food they had supplied during the summer, and that's to the tune of 700 pounds. Dalhousie had written checks on the British Treasury and is now asking Bathurst to see that those checks were covered. In the early days, Dalhousie appears to be attempting to right a wrong. On the other hand, in the closing letter, he informs Bathurst that he considers the black refugees to pose a long-term burden to the public. Many of them will prove industrious, industrious and valuable settlers, yet there are many bad subjects who will never do well under any circumstances. Dalhousie blames the refugees for their misery and does not see them as worthy beneficiaries of public largesse. This despite the fact that the black refugees had arrived with few possessions, many in poor health, their neglect since Sherbrooke's departure, the poor land they had been accorded, and their failed crops due to circumstances beyond their control. Not only does it seem unreasonable given the circumstances, but also the short amount of time since Dalhousie's arrival would not have permitted him to survey the black refugee communities and the meager resources they had been accorded and make a proper first-hand assessment. This raises a question, who did Dalhousie consider to be the public? Obviously not the black refugees. One can also infer that Dalhousie's brusque assessment was clearly based on racism. After all, Given the global climatic change that year due to a volcanic eruption in Indonesia, every farmer would have experienced a crop failure and every settler would have been in dire straits. Dalhousie should have been well aware that poverty, upheaval, meager resources and a natural catastrophe played significant roles in the condition of this vulnerable population. He only had to observe the black refugees' industry and circumstances and put himself in, these, uh, in their place before passing 
such hard judgment on this already marginalized group of people. In his second letter to Bathurst, that, uh, dated December 29, 1816, we can see Dalhousie's resolve to treat the Black refugees humanely. He does so when he overrules a decision that the provincial authority had made regarding the location of ration depots. However, also in this letter, his view on race and slavery became clear. And so some of the officials wanted to place this, the ration depots where the refugees would go to collect food, um, wanted to place them in, in Dartmouth closer to Halifax. And Dalhousie said, no, people are living in Preston. It's closer um, for it to remain more in Dartmouth than bring it close, close to the harbor. So he overruled that. However, also in this letter, his views on race and slavery became even more clear. He opens the letter by reporting that after having ordered a muster, which is a census, he found that the number of black refugees far exceeded what he had expected. As a consequent, consequence, he was only allowing rations until June 1st, when the winter of this climate ends and country labor opens up with immense demands for hands, he states. So I want you to notice this. In, in the previous letter, he's saying, I'm going to give rations until June 1st, and after that, I'm going to cut it off. No, he states, well, the, the country season will, will open, the farming season will open, and the farmers will need hands so they can go and work for their bread. After May 31st, he leaves their well-being to whatever labor demand there may be. Nothing suggests he took into account the prejudice against black workers. Nonetheless, Dalhousie shows some compassion when he notes that he found it necessary to depart from the advice of the council and frame an order to which issues of ration should be guided. Here he notes that he has reversed the council's order to move the ration depot to Dartmouth, which, had, which was between four and 12 miles from Preston and most other black communities, obliging the black refugees to carry their rations further than many others would have already done. While he had rejected the council's advice on the location of the ration depot, at the same time, the manner in which the rations were to be absorbed, supervised, would put, and I quote from him, a check on the undeserving and largely repay to the public any additional expense of this officer. There would be no rations for the idle unless they were old or ill. But whereas the council had ordered that families with absent heads of household would not receive rations as heads of families, um, um, the council notes that as heads of families, black people were too accustomed to go themselves to Halifax or elsewhere in search of employment or pleasure. Dalhousie asserts that male heads of household might have good reason to be absent and should receive rations as long as their absence is casual and does not impede the cultivation of ground allotted. And again, after May 31st, he would leave their well-being to whatever labor demands there might be. Nothing suggests, as mentioned, he took into account the prejudice against black workers. As well, elsewhere in this letter, and only months after a crop failure, he expresses doubt about the prospect of the black refugees' success when he states, little hope can be entertained of settling these people so as to provide for their families and wants. They must be supported for many years. Slaves by habit and education, no longer working under the dread of the lash, their idea of freedom is idleness, and they're therefore quite incapable of industry. Dalhousie also suggests that the black refugees he's now referring to deeply regret quitting their masters and their constitution is unequal to the severity of the climate. Further, 
He holds the same opinion as the Nova Scotia Assembly when he suggests that it would be most desirable to restore them to their masters in America or send them to Sierra Leone. He firmly believes that either place would be agreeable to the greater part of them, but to the West Indies, they will not go. So I just wanna pause and say, here, by the time we, we are in the new year, by the time we are in January, or certainly December 26, 1816, Dalhousie has given up on, on the black refugees. He said, they're not gonna do well. They're slaves by habit and education. They will only do well unless they're driven under the dread of the lash. Their idea of freedom is idleness. Imagine these are people who um, fled their plantation, who waded through swamps, who fought in a war uh, for their freedom, and, and, and who came and were placed on these rocky land and given swampy soil and, and made the best that they could. And here's this man saying they're idle and they're quite incapable of industry and his solution to the refugee problem is to deport them to Sierra Leone and even more, more egregious to send them back to the United States, to their former masters, to send them back to slavery as if the black refugees um, would want to return to slavery. Of course, they told him, no, we're not interested. And they didn't want to go to Trinidad either. In 1816, 1817, Trinidad was still a slave colony. So why would the black refugees uh, jump on ships, sail on the high seas to Trinidad when they could be uh, captured on those ships and re-enslaved or even re-enslaved once they got to Trinidad? Here, during his early weeks in the colony, Dalhousie had already shown that he did not see the majority of black immigrants as potentially provided any benefit to the colony. Yet in his later letters to Bathurst, he expresses very different views of white settlers who were also arriving in large numbers from Ireland and Scotland, some via Newfoundland. Dalhousie urges Bathurst to provide assistance to these would-be white settlers. So clearly um, he saw, and we have more evidence, um, or he conceptualized uh, Nova Scotia as a white man's country. He really didn't want the black refugees. Sherbrooke didn't want the black refugees either, but they sort of rolled out the red carpet as best as they could for the white settlers. And even to so-called foreign Protestants, people were coming from Germany and, and Switzerland. Two other points in this letter are worth noting. As in the first letter, Dalhousie once again notes that the legislature and the white inhabitants do not want the black refugees in the colony. Both groups consider the black people to be a class of subjects that will never do well as settlers and therefore will not give them uh, a countenance or assistance. In other words, the white folks of Nova Scotia from the government to the common people did not want the black refugee refugees in the colony and refused to assist them. This and the inhabitants views, inhabitants view of Nova Scotia as a white man's country is no doubt why upon his arrival Dalhousie found the black refugees in a state of starvation. No one had been willing to help them during the four month interval between uh, Sherbrooke's departure um, and Dalhousie's arrival that same year. And within a few short weeks, the new Lieutenant Governor himself gave up on the majority of the refugees. If Dalhousie was not forthcoming with the necessary assistance, then the only future he saw for the black refugees was not in Nova Scotia. So it seems that one plank of his administration's policy toward the black refugees was to discipline and toughen them up by limiting and even den denying food supplies to the point where they face starvation. Another plank was um, to remove them, this policy of removal. It wasn't a, a successful policy, but he pursued it for a while. 
Dalhousie's third letter to, to Bathurst is dated January 2nd, 1817. And here he informs the Secretary of State about his discussion with the assembly on augmenting the population of Nova Scotia with white civilians and military veterans who were migrating from Britain and Newfoundland to Nova Scotia. He wants these immigrants to receive the same support he believes the immigrants to Lower and Upper Canada were receiving at the time. He also remarks on the condition of the immigrant Scottish Highlanders in Pictou County. They too had experienced crop failure and were in need of help. He expresses a desire to help the Chelsea pensioners, these are veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, who had been promised grants of land. And he's also supportive of 505 young men, chiefly Irish. Although these men were in need, Dalhousie is certain that with proper assistance, they would do well. He notes that these men have lately arrived totally destitute of bread and other means of subsistence. They are desirous to settle in the province, he states, and if we can continue to feed them or find them work during the winter, there will be no doubt that they will prove a valuable acquisition. This is in complete contrast to his attitude toward the black refugees. Dalhousie recommends following the advice of the assembly that the fees that the, the new white immigrants, they had to pay a fee for the surveying of land and so on. Um, be reduced, omitted, or defrayed, noting that these fees were a hardship for these people and had caused them what he calls distress. And we didn't hear, um, he didn't recommend uh, this, that this be, you know, be given, the, the waiving of the fee be done for the Black refugees as their, their land are being surveyed. He also recommends three years of assistance for a group of settlers, white settlers who had not experienced the same hardships as the Black refugees and offers an example of a successful outcome of such largesse. Yet he does not include the Black refugees in this request, um, despite having the opinion that many of them will prove industrious and valuable settlers. It is important to note that the British Crown was responsible for the Black refugees and that soldiers of the disbanded regiments at the end of the War of 1812. The colony itself could assist settlers out of its own revenues and it sometimes did. So um, the Crown was responsible for the Black refugees and, and disbanded soldiers, but settlers who were coming in under their own steam um, was the, if they were to receive help, it should be or sh should have been from the colonial government. But here we find um, Dalhousie writing to Bathurst, the Crown, really writing to this official of the Crown, begging support for these people who were the responsibility of the colony, these white people. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, um, I'll just skip because we have some more letters to, to cover, and I am aware of the time. Dalhousie's fourth letter to Bathurst is dated a year after, a day after the second, and it is brief, um, having followed a previous letter by one day. Here he writes that he has spent 576 pounds of crown funds to support the black refugees during the latter part of 1816, and he notes that Bathurst had authorize this funding or, or this, you know, financial support. A sense of urgency can be read into this communication. We can also discern that Dalhousie is receiving a little support from the Lords of the British Treasury, at least in regard to the expenditure to, to provide for the Black refugees. He notes that he found them in a state of starvation corrected a wrong and understandably did not want to be told that his checks on the British account had been refused and that he would have to pay the bill from his own funds. Thus he insisted that Bathurst clarified to the Lords of the Treasury that he had already sanctioned these funds for the purpose of the Black refugees. 
Now we get to the fifth letter in May of 1817, and Dalhousie reports that further steps had been taken to reduce the Black refugees' expense to the public. So he, and again, he's saying, by June 1st, I'm gonna cut the Russians. I must of necessity, and he's gonna cut the Russian, the not the Russians, the rations by one half. But then he notes that I must of necessity continue to give these people rations, but he's cutting it by half until they can raise their crops. For without that support, they will utterly starve. In other words, Dalhousie is only worried about preventing starvation on the part of those whom he identified as industrious farmers. They have to get rations, he notes, so that they can stay alive to raise their crops. Those whom he sees as idle, he is happy to let starve, and those um, he sees as idle amount to half the refugee population. Um, and so Dalhousie is faced with a black community whose crops had failed and who had just survived another harsh Nova Scotia winter. They were in dire straits and he tries to be compassionate, but his compassion appears feigned. The black refugees are caught between imperial stinginess and Dalhousie's frustration at their condition. He never mentions a small Lots of poor land they have been accorded, the meager rations, as I've mentioned, the crop failure of the prior year. Like many white colonial administrators, he uses food to brutally impose his will on the non-white populations under his control. And so, um, uh, you, you, you know, as we come to a close, and I can say this without reading the letter, by the time we get to June 1st, 1817, he has cut the Russians um, by half. He has stopped issuing the blankets and the, the, the coats and um, the clothing and whatever else that were promised to the black refugees. Um, Bathurst replies to him and said, you know, Dalhousie, you can use the casting fund. The casting fund was this money that they, during the war, the Nova Scotians and the British had taken under, under Sherbrooke from Castine in Maine, something uh, to the tune of 12,000 Halifax pounds. So it was sitting in, Halif in Halifax now. And Bathurst is saying, use the Castine funds, it's crown money, use it to support the, 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 the settlers. Bathurst never said the black refugees uh, per se, but he, 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 he um, gave Dalhousie the you know, the authority, the permission to use the casting money to help the, um, people who were coming in. But Dalhousie said, no, I don't want to use the casting money. You know, I have more important things to do with it. And as we know, Dalhousie basically used the casting money to endow Dalhousie College, or what became um, Dalhousie University. And in one of his final letters to, to Bathurst, he gives even more details of his measure, the measures he's used to cut Russians to reduce costs, even after having visited several settlements and witnessed um, the black refugees, their industry. He, in 1817, he visited them and he said, that, oh, they're so industrious, he couldn't believe it. And yet, but still, he reduced their rations. Um, this seems contradictory to assist in these uh, people's efforts. Indeed, one could assume that this was a calculated policy that posed a major barrier to the success of the black refugees. That is, if Dalhousie saw their industry, even in the face of so many barriers, why would he not consider them to be a potential asset as settlers in a colony whose very success depended on increasing its population. Indeed, he saw their stay as temporary, even though their, their alternatives were either to return to their former brief, brutal and dangerous lives as enslaved people in the US or in the West Indies, or to continue to struggle 
to settle in Nova Scotia and avoid starvation under the crown and colonial policies that were mainly overseen by governors, including Dalhousie. It is important to note the weight of the term industry as Dalhousie uses it. As the 18th century drew to a close, the growth of industrial capitalism in England threw the rural economy into chaos, massively disrupted the urban labor market and left people starving in the countryside and in the streets. As the poor became disenfranchised and marginalized, the governing classes, both the political and economic elite intensified their moralizing about poverty, setting new standards of worthy poverty, deservedness and work effort they termed industry. According to this ideology, the poor were slothful and lazy by nature and only external discipline and the threat of hunger could whip them into industry. Black people in the British Empire, the majority of whom were enslaved at this time, were also ascribed the negative characteristics of laziness, laziness and sloth. This was despite the fact that through their unpaid labor, they were creating much of the wealth that the empire enjoyed. The white population also saw the refugees' blackness as rendering them bit biologically inferior. That's the white population in Nova Scotia and also in Britain. Thus Dalhousie was joined on a well-developed discourse and vocabulary when he described these people in such negative terms despite their industry. He did not consider the black refugees were working under the lash, but rather according to their own determination to succeed and that all they needed in post-war of 18, the post-war world of 1812 of Nova Scotia was a little assistance, the same assistance he urged for and afforded white settlers. In the last letter we have from Dalhousie about the black refugees, dated June 10th, 1819, he refers to Bathurst's July 18, 18 letter, which instructs him to cut back rations to any settler any settlers except specified regiments of disbanded soldiers. Accordingly, Dalhousie says that in October 1818, he had put a stop to the issue of rations to the black refugees, leaving them to their industry and personal exertion to obtain sub subsistence. Although Bathurst had instructed him in general terms, Dalhousie must be seen as responsible for the interpretation he put on those instructions, which did not refer specifically to the black refugees. The consequences for the black refugees were dire. They preserved and persevered under great privation and want until the month of March, 1819, when their means totally failed and most urgent representation was made to be of their alarming state. And this is Dalhousie writing it. Yet he could also write in the same letter, I am sorry now to confess that though they use their best exertions, that is the black refugees, and have experienced the effects of idleness to prompt them to further industry and frugality, the habits of their life and constitutional laziness will continue and these miserable creatures will be for years a burden upon the government. And so the, the Lieutenant Governor blames the black refugees for the, their own misfortune and what he believes to be their innate biological inferiority. And even though, uh, so he, it's this paradoxical relationship in a way, because he, even though he recognizes that some had been industrious to him, the majority were constitutionally lazy and would continue to pose a burden on the colony. And so 
For four years, the British Dalhousie, the British government, and the government of Nova Scotia failed to implement a sustainable policy that would have provided meaningful structural support to a population that showed courage and industry, to use his word, despite the challenges that nature, politics, and the prejudice of the day um, put before them. Instead of in integrating them as worthy British subjects, the governor pursues a plan of limited aid through insufficient rations. And Dalhousie uses industry as a work test or the work test for eligibility for rations. And when their industry proved insufficient, he cuts off rations altogether, even as this vulnerable population faced starvation. Dalhousie also used Nova Scotia's cold climate as being the rationale for sending away the black refugees. Uh, one scholar, Isoko Asaka, tells us that, and I quote, assertion was rooted, this assertion was rooted in the same logic invoked by Scottish settlers who grounded their claims of colonial belonging in their physical compatibility with the province's coldness. So the desire to send black people back to their true home in the tropics and to significantly reduce their rations formed important planks of Dalhousie's policies towards the black refugees, a policy based on paternalism, frustration, hostility, and racism. And I um, will end it at this time. I'll just quickly um, go through some of the slides talking about the West India, West India trade, um, Nova Scotia's and Halifax's connection to Caribbean slavery. And so, so many of the, the, the merchants in the city and in the province gained their fortune through the West India trade. We, in, in the province, we use sugar, molasses, rum, in the region as a whole that was um, produced by enslaved laborers in the West Indies, whether it was the British West Indies or Spanish West Indies or, or French West Indies. And, and here again, more information on the Castine Fund, which was used to endow Dalhousie University. And for us uh, in, in this lecture, in this presentation, the Castine Fund is of super importance because Dalhousie could have used that money to support the, the black refugees. He instead chose to um, establish this university to which the black refugees and their descendants for a long time had no access to. And so um, let us just look at, at the summary and maybe we can look at summary number two, the second summary here. Lord Dalhousie shared the widespread belief though, as I, uh, um, it's important to say not universal, but this widespread racist belief in the idleness and lack of industriousness of formerly enslaved black peoples, He had the opportunity to use a Castine Fund, as mentioned, but did not do so. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I will answer any questions if you have any questions. Thank you. I think we are all extremely impressed with you. This is the power of the archival record in the hands of someone who can take it and provide the context for us to understand it. This has been a wonderful uh, introduction to this topic. Sarah Hollett is going to take over at this point and fill Shirley Tillotson's role as the moderator. And I would encourage those who want to participate to let us know electronically or some other way through the screen.
It's over to you, Sarah. And thank you again, Athua. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes, thanks, Athua. That was an extremely thorough examination of Dalhousie, of course, founder and namesake of Dalhousie <laughs> University. Um, we'll do, we could do video if you're comfortable, or you could use the chat function. Nicole Neepy already has a question. So we'll, we'll start with you, Nicole. You can type a uh, unmute your screen or okay no I think I'll speak directly yeah uh, thank you Afua this was uh, fascinating and as uh, Lois was saying you've mined so much out of these documents now I was just wondering I was curious because this isn't the first wave of black people to arrive in Nova Scotia uh, 30 years before there were some uh, of the black loyalists and I was just curious I guess it didn't come out in the, the letters but how British authorities might have been uh, their attitudes uh, informed by the experience that their predecessors had with this other group of black uh, migrants or however you want to, to define them at that stage. Do you, do you think that shaped their views as well, that Dalhousie's views as well? Okay. Thank you. Well, Dalhousie pretty much um, followed Sherbrooke's direction. I mean, Sherbrooke was the governor before. And if you, so you, you ask about the, the Black loyalists um, during and after the American Revolutionary War 30 years prior. But remember, that was also a disaster when the Black loyalists were settled in Nova Scotia. It was also a disaster. The, uh, some arrived right at the start of the war, 1777, but most arrived in 1783 when, when the war ended. And um, same thing as with the black refugees, they were promised land, rights as British subjects, education for their children, employment, you name it. Most, most didn't receive the land. Um, Many, when you look at Thomas Peters, one of their leaders who went to England in 1790 to plead the cause of the black refugees. And, you know, in his petition, he notes that many of the black refugees, the, not the black refugees, the black loyalists who were free, um, gained their freedom by joining the British army and uh, came to Nova Scotia, were kidnapped and sold into slavery to the United States or to the West Indies. They, uh, if you uh, remember Lydia Jackson, she signed an indentureship, which she thought was for one year, but because she wasn't uh, literate, the, the man with whom she signed the indenture um, had 39 years in the contract. So that's slavery. So uh, those are some of the, the um, things that happened to the, the black refugees. And that's why in 1792, January 1792, 1100 of them left Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and went to Sierra Leone. So it, you know, it, that really showed you what the imperial government thought of them. In fact, the imperial government also used them by sending them to Sierra Leone, but that's another story. So the support from the imperial government wasn't forthcoming and the support from both colonial governments, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, wasn't as you know, robust as it should have been. They, again, they were promised all these things. And 30 years, we have another war, same situation, same strategy from the British military and the British Navy. Run, uh, slaves, run away, leave your masters, we'll give you your freedom, come and fight for us. Same, exact same thing. And um, this time in uh, 1812, post-1812, the, the British officials, remember it's human beings who are on the ground um, implementing, you know, and, and carrying out these instructions. These officials, they have a lot of power. Cochrane had a lot of power, Admiral Cochrane. He, he just kind of basically loaded up people on ships and sent them to Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. You have to take them. I'm representing the Crown. So in the, the, the provincial government in Nova Scotia at the time, 1812, 1813, didn't have a say in the matter. Cochrane basically dumped the people on them. Um, the crown is promising you this. Of course, he had um, support 
and permission from, from Whitehall. What are this? So, you know, the, the point is that they had a lot of power. Sherbrooke had a lot of power. Dalhousie had a lot of power. Kent had a lot of power. All these governments, the legislatures had a lot of power. They could have done better, but they chose not to. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, we've got a question from James Phillips in the chat. The focus of your talk has been Dalhousie, obviously, but were his attitudes to black people any different from the vast majority of people in Britain, British North America, or the US? I think you had mentioned a few times that it was widespread, but not necessarily um, consistent uh, across. across yeah, it was widespread, but not universal. And so some people would say, well, Dalhousie was a man of his the time. True and not true because we are in the period of the abolitionist movement. The, the white people who were involved in the abolitionist movement say what you want to say about Wilberforce. Yes, he, he was paternalistic and all of that. And at the beginning of his career was for a gradual abolition, but they did not um, subscribe to this ideology of say black inferiority or black people innately inferior. Right? You had people like Granville Sharp and Thomas Clarkson and a, a whole slew of people who were pursuing a more, who subscribed to rather a more enlightened discourse. They didn't see black people as a burden on society. In fact, um, the, the white abolitionists in, in England and other places in Europe were basically saying, look, these people have provided wealth for the empire through their hard work. And by this time too, um, many of, of the, 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 the white leaders, many of them were evangelical Christians and they believed in the, the, the divine origin of humanity, that we are all of one blood, that we came from one source. So if a person is, let's say degraded, it wasn't because of his or her race, it was because of his or her condition. Whereas basically Dalhousie is saying, look, we, we have to give up on these people. They're innately constitutionally inferior, forget them. Within Nova Scotia, within Halifax, you had people like Chamberlain who was a land surveyor and, and Dr. Seth Coleman, a Quaker doctor in Dartmouth who visited the refugees, who spoke highly of them. Dr. Coleman actually said, look, if white people were had to go through what the black uh, refugees had gone through and had to endure these terrible conditions, white people would have fallen apart. Basically, you know, I'm paraphrasing him. Dr. Coleman saw, saw, saw that they were virtuous, that they were hardworking, that they were industrious, that they were patient. And so if there are whites in Halifax and in Nova Scotia who thought the opposite of Dalhousie, then certainly this excuse that he was a man of his time um, is gonna fall flat somewhere along the line because there was a stream of enlightened discourse, you know, all throughout Europe, throughout the Caribbean and throughout North America. So surely, surely that's not to deny the racist discourse that was still in vogue, that was still current and as, as the century drew to a close even more so. Thanks, Safua. Does anybody, anybody else have any questions? I've got a comment from the chat. Cheyenne, would you like to uh, talk or would you like to chat in the chat? Hi, I'd like to. Yeah, go for it. Me? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, Dr. Cooper, that was amazing. My name is Cheyenne. I'm actually a Dalhousie student. I'm going to be minoring in the Black African diaspora, so I can't wait to take your courses. You are the reason I chose that minor. And uh, this was amazing. I had no idea about this cast-in, casting agreement thing. But now I just want to say it's, you know, I just want to thank you for taking the time and the effort to share all this information with us. And I know that uh, Lord Dalhousie is rolling over in his grave that people like me are going to Dalhousie and I can't wait to continue to allow him to, to just roll over even more. So thank you for everything that you're, you're sharing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Cheyenne, you're welcome. Thanks. Um, John Reed has his hand raised. 
John, if you want to unmute yourself and open your video, you can do so. Uh, th thanks so much for, for again for a really interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm curious. One of the things I, I found really interesting um, was the way in which you brought out the contradictions in Dalhousie's thoughts and actions. That uh, things that he said at one point were repudiated at another time, and uh, the way words and actions didn't uh, uh, necessarily coincide. I guess my, my question is from, from your reading of Dalhousie. Um, was he aware of contradictions or was he just blithely unaware? Uh, I mean, you, you would think that uh, you know, Dalhousie um, uh, was a figure who did have a background in the Scottish Enlightenment. And yet, as you rightly point out, I mean, this is the way he's, uh, he's doing things. Is this a conscious thing, do you think, or is it uh, just uh, something that's uh, unconscious to him? Okay, John, th thank you for your question. I think th there is a lot of frustration there. He arrives in the colony. Um, Tracy Smith, who was a you know, temporary administrator, had basically left the, the refugees unprovided for. So Dallos is pissed. Um, he's, he's coming from the war. Remember, he, he was brigadier general in, in the war. He gets this position. He arrives in Nova Scotia and everything is in sort of disarray from his perspective. As I've said earlier, Cochrane sent up hundreds and thousands of these people <laughs> without even alerting the Nova Scotia government that they were coming. So, I mean, think of today, uh, you know, you have thousands of refugees landing at the door. What do you do, right? Um, this is compounded by the fact that they're black. So yes, I think Dalhousie is aware. Dalhousie doesn't want to um, spend the province's money because he's thinking the province doesn't have much money and he wants to, Dalhousie is also an improver. He's a progressive, he's a modernizer. He, he, he builds roads and, and bridges and he improves the transportation system and so on. He wants to focus on that. He wants to prepare the province for defense. There could be another war. He's a soldier. He wants to do all of those things. Um, but he, I, I, I really think he has a problem with race. And I didn't elaborate on, on his invasion of Martinique. So two things. In 1794, as a young man, he invades Martinique. He was a colonel in the British uh, military. The Anglo-Franco wars were going on. Um, the, the, the French Republican government had abolished slavery in Martinique and Guadeloupe and Haiti. Um, the, the British declared war against France. And so the West Indies is this theater of war. Right, so Britain invades Martinique, Dalhousie at the helm, reinstituted slavery in, in Martinique. So this is one of his first acts as a, you know, as a soldier establishing himself. He crushed the hopes and the dreams of black people in Martinique. He's, he's injured, he's sent back to England, he goes on to Europe to fight. Um, so that's kind of like one of his first experiences with crushing black liberation. When Dalhousie was born, slavery was still legal in Scotland. Uh, in, we, we had the, the Joseph Knight case. By 1778, the Scottish court ruled slavery illegal in Scotland. Well, I'm saying he grew up in this context uh, and, uh, um, you know, of Atlantic slavery, of Scotland being involved in, in, in the slave trade and in slavery. And Carly Kehoe uh, has done important work on that, the Scottish role in transatlantic slavery and in Caribbean slavery and so forth. So that's that he's, that he's an aristocrat, he, uh, that's his milieu. He goes to the University of Edinburgh. He's exposed to enlightenment philosophy, but being exposed to it and kind of being exposed to black people is, is a different thing. So all these things we, we put in the pot. 
his frustration, his not wanting to spend the casting money because he had other ideas for it. Um, his desire though, so this is why I know he's conscious of it because here's his desire to help the 500 young men chiefly Irish and the Chelsea pensioners and the, and the French, the returning Acadians in, in Clear County, his desire to help them, you know, writing to Bather saying, send more money or please cash this check. But when it comes to the black refugee, you know, there is such a huge difference in his attitude and his, in his actions towards them. So I think he knows what he's doing. And I think that makes it even more cruel. Um, I mean, a hundred years later, is it a hundred years later? Uh, we, we have this situation with John A. MacDonald, you know, starving the indigenous people on, on the prairies. There's this book out, I can't remember the name of the author. But um, but yes, so Dalhousie is aware. I th when he when he goes to the some of the settlements and he sees, he said they're starving, and I think that turned his heart a little bit to you know make it more compassionate. And he said, okay, okay, I will not seize the the rations. I'll just cut it by half. But then even by the time we get to his last letter, he stops the the rations. But, and he notes that they are perishing. And that to me is just a, a very cruel thing. Yeah, James Dashok clearing the plains in which he talks about um, MacDonald using uh, food as, as, you know, as, as policy to, to whip the people into submission. So a hundred years before we see Dalhousie actually using this policy. I think you're, um... Uh, your comparison of the Irish from Newfoundland with the black refugees is really powerful because uh, you know, in, in many ways I think one can make parallels in uh, certain aspects of the experience of the two groups and yet they do receive totally different uh, treatments. So I think that, that was another really powerful point in your, your talk. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. John, does anyone else have any comments or questions? No. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, Lois, do you have a question? I actually do too. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Others question. first. I'll save mine. Stephanie, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, thank you for your uh, lecture. It was quite informative. I was wondering, uh, Dr. Cooper, do you think it's problematic? Uh, I know you've talked about it in the news a little bit, uh, but to have Dalhousie University um, have the name Dalhousie attached to it, especially with his uh, less than savory relations with uh, racial minorities. Okay, yes. And I, I should say that this um, talk, the research for this talk came out of the work we did, the, Lord, the panel that was struck a couple of years ago to examine Dalhousie the man and Dalhousie the university's relationship to race and slavery. So it's, it's, um, it's a much uh, broader research we did. Um, Dr. Tillotson, who, who's not here, also contributed greatly to this research. And, and so we had the panel and um, we, we responded to the mandate and the mandate from the president's office was to do a historical investigation. At the same time, we did discuss the, um, this whole issue of, of, of the name. Should the name remain Dalhousie University? Should it be changed? But that was not our mandate. We were not mandated. That, that has to be a separate discussion with the board of governors and with other officials and, and the students and, and so on. But we, we, we did canvas people, we did have the discussion and we came to the conclusion that the, in fact, we discovered that to change a name would cost millions and millions of dollars because you're thinking of something as, we don't think of the pen, right? Which has the logo of the school, um, that particular logo, the name of the school, that would have to be changed. The stationery would have to be changed. Um, many, many, uh, the Alumni Association is quite 
um, powerful. It's quite vast. It's very much engaged in the goings on of the university. Many people felt that in, eight, in 2018, 2020, 2021, it's not the same university that was established in 1818, that the university today has more of a democratic impulse. It's, uh, it's um, providing scholarship, it's welcoming. And in fact, Dalhousie University was one of the first institutions of higher education in Canada to admit women to, to, um, to the school. White women nonetheless, but it was still a progressive um, thing to do back in, you know, 1840s, 1850s, when most schools were denying women that opportunity. And so um, people felt that the, the money would better spend in providing for scholarships to attract and to retain Black students, whether they are descended from these um, uh, black communities in Nova Scotia or from across Canada or from the West Indies. I mean, it's the West India trade that really made Halifax rich. And so we were more interested in providing scholarships for students, attracting students, in doing targeted hires of black faculty and staff, that sort of thing. But um, we didn't have, uh, we weren't empowered and we certainly didn't have the authority to, you know, recommend a name change that would have to be a, a huge discussion and a huge process. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think we'd have time for one more question. I, Lois had a question. Um, Lois, did you want to ask your question? Or No, Stephanie's question was similar to mine. Sarah, I, maybe you have the last question. I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that was on on everybody's minds, probably. Um, does anybody else have a question that's in their mind? I think we could probably go on for quite some time here. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Cooper. Uh, thanks for your time. And um, I think we're going to go ahead and do the AGM now. Lois, do you have any final comments before we? I would like to thank Afua very much. This has been stimulating. Uh, my mind could ask you several questions, but again, <laughs> we have an AGM, so I have to curb my interest. We will be looking forward with much interest to how your work progresses, particularly your new endeavor, uh, thanks to PCH federal funding. We wish you the very best and we thank you sincerely. Thank you so much, Lois, and to the team and to all our audience. Have a good night. Bye-bye.